Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say I'm very privileged to be able to come and speak in Penang to your church. Um, by way of introduction, I've uh, attached a, a few photos. I'm chairman of Annan, which is a health center in Tampin, south of uh, Penang, obviously. Um, it's near Surambai. Uh, this, this place has been going for, the work has been going for like 17, 18 years. And uh, it's a beautiful place. And for those who have not been there, come visit us. Uh, that's the schoolhouse, staff housing, the white one. And that one is the doctor's residence. Um, on a clear day, this is the, the scene that greets you in the morning. So come visit us. Uh, it's called Annan. And I'm chairman of the, uh, the board there. Now, I've come to speak with you on what true biblical meditation is, and obviously what's false. And this morning, we start with number one, neuroscience, the brain and the mind in meditation. And then in the afternoon, we go into uh, what the East tells you about meditation, what they really believe. Uh, their silence is not silence. Uh, because it's full of spiritual meaning, and I'll go through that. And then we'll go through where it is all going. Because meditation, Eastern meditation, has come into Christian church. It's also come into uh, mental health therapy, like mindfulness cognitive therapy for depression, and mindfulness-based stress relief, MBSR, for stress. It's come into schools for children. Right? It's, it's in the US, it's in Canada, Europe, and Australia. So it's really big. There is a meditation uh, or mindfulness, uh, what's a, a, an app that's had 14 million downloads just on one app. Right? People who do meditation and yoga go by the millions. So it's become really huge. So what is driving it? And where is it going? And then this afternoon, I'm going to include a portion on mindfulness because that is growing. Now, first of all, let's talk about the ACC, right? Uh, the frontal lobe, our frontal lobe, the front of your brain. For the human being, it's 33% versus cats and dogs at 3%, 7%, monkeys at 7, 17%. But for the human brain, it's 33%, and that's where it's really important. Now, a psychiatrist, Dr. Tim Jennings, says this, a special part of the frontal cortex, called the anterior cingulate cortex, we'll call it ACC for short, is our neurological heart. It is here we experience love, compassion, empathy, sympathy, altruism, and the ACC is also the seat of the will and the place we choose right from wrong. Now, in church worship, this morning, is the ACC important to you? Should it be really active? Of course, right? It's about love, choosing right from wrong, it's about the will. Okay? So it should be uncompromised and it should be really active. Now, Dr. Buroga, University of Montreal, he got very uh, curious about which part of the brain lights up when one is in romantic love or when one is in unconditional love. So he designed romantic love. He looks at the brain of people when they are, when it's online active. Okay, um, so for romantic love, he chose probably the, the lady and showed a picture of the man she's romantically entwined with. And he could see that three parts of the brain lights up. And the ACC is one of them. Then he got curious, what about unconditional love? And he looked and the way he designed unconditional love was, well, put a, the carer in, in the machine and show the carer the person he is caring for. And unconditional, the conditions for unconditional is the person cared for must be old, poor, so sick that they cannot repay back. So it's unconditional. And guess what? Seven parts of the brain lights up, like a Christmas tree. Now when your brain lights up, it's very good. People with Alzheimer's, dementia, their brains are very quiet. Okay. So when your brain lights up in seven places, including the ACC, right, it's your immediate reward 
for rendering unconditional love. In other words, the moment we are so designed that the moment we render unconditional love, we have our reward immediately. You are designed by God for rendering unconditional love, receiving your reward immediately. And what's more, a lot of other scientists are looking at this place called the HGC. And it is the place of hope and optimism. And they call it the hope and optimism circuit. Right? It's like uh, one of your, your switches. It's so hardwired that when you switch it on, the lights come on, the fan come on. It's a circuit. When you activate your HCC, something else at the back called the amygdala. The amygdala is what causes you stress, uh, causes you depression. For example, if your boss works you continuously, uh, doesn't give you help, is unsympathetic to your request week after week, your amygdala at the back of your brain becomes very active, can even become bigger, and then you get depressed. But what scientists found was, when you activate your ACC, your amygdala calms down, and your hope and optimism rises, and your depression goes away. And this is not just one researcher, these are numerous researchers telling you that. So, at the same time, God has given you an, a hope and optimism circuit. Right? Is it impossible for any one of us to render unconditional love to someone else? It's impossible, right? Any one of us can do it. And it raises your hope and optimism, it gets rid of your depression. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I'm going to take you through the neuroscience and show you that Eastern meditation and now false Christian meditation and mindfulness actually doesn't activate the frontal lobe. Right? And so if it doesn't activate the frontal lobe, you may feel calm because it calms the amygdala. It, calms, it just calms the amygdala, so you feel calm. But it doesn't give you hope and optimism. But if you can activate your frontal lobe, it gives you hope and optimism and calms the amygdala at the same time. Now, if I were to ask you here, do you just want your amygdala to be calm? Or do you want to have hope and optimism which calms your amygdala? Which do you choose? The second. Right? So, Christian meditation, true biblical meditation, and I'll show you, activates your ACC activates your frontal lobe. Okay? Now, I want to talk about Psalms 19. Psalms 19 is where King David meditated. And go home and read it. I'll just scan it because I'm talking about meditation. I'm not studying Psalms 19. But the point is, Psalms 19, verse 14, tells you that King David was meditating. Because he said, May the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. That's verse 14. So verse 1 to 13 is his meditation. Now, this is true biblical meditation. I'll just scan it with you, okay? King David said, The heavens declare God's glory, His handiwork, His speech, knowledge. Then he saw the sun, and he said the sun was like a bridegroom, a strong man to run a race. And then he began to meditate on the law, the statutes, commandments, fear of God, His righteousness, His judgment. And they, he said all these were like fine gold and honey. Warning and reward. Then he came to this point. He said, clean me from my secret faults. In other words, he was meditating. He saw the sun as a bridegroom. If you see a bridegroom, Christ, as the sun, coming for you, what do you expect? You expect a wedding, right? You expect to be loved, right? So he saw the sun as a bridegroom. He saw Christ coming. He's expecting a wedding. He's expecting a marriage. And then he began to meditate on law, the statutes, commandments, fear of God, his righteous judgment, and said they were like honey and had warning and reward. And then he came to this thing where he became transparent in the context of the love of God for him. The bridegroom coming for a wedding with him. He wanted to be pure. So he opened his heart in trust and love of God. And he said, show me my secret faults. Faults that I don't even know of myself. Show them to me. That I may be clean. I may be prepared for this great big wedding. 
So, true meditation brought him to trust God so much and to be comforted by God's love so much that he would become transparent to God. And then he said, keep me from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and innocent from the great transgression. So not only did he want to know about his secret faults, but keep me from thinking presumptuously, from making all kinds of assumptions of my grandeur. Show me if I'm wrong. So this man in meditation opened his heart and became transparent and trusted in God to show him whether he was good or bad, to, 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 to reveal to his heart, to cause him to differentiate between what's good and what's it? Evil. That is the outcome of biblical meditation. But to know one's heart in the context of the love of God, that's the important thing. That in the context of God's embracing love, He searches our hearts and shows us what we need to know about ourselves. Okay, that's biblical meditation. Now, the differences between Eastern and Biblical. So we, we talked about Biblical. It's focused biblically on a personal God of love based, active, interactive, reflective, passionate, consummate, purgative, cleansing in relation to the person of God. Okay, now Eastern. It's detached by mantra, by breath, by riddle. Okay, when I was, do, I was doing Zen for 20 years, started when I was about 20, stopped when I became a Seventh day Adventist. In Eastern meditation, what happens to, to one is, one, the whole objective is to empty the mind, that the mind does not think of anything for hours. And the method to help one do that was to follow one's breath and to count it in cycles of 10, breathing out one, two, and so forth, 10, and then go back to one, and doing it for hours. In that counting, the idea is to keep away all thoughts, nothing, okay? The other one that I did when I was doing Zen was, it was a riddle, a Japanese riddle. Zen is uh, Japanese Buddhism. It's to think about what's the sound of one hand clapping. What's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> nothing. And to think of it for hours, right? To empty the mind. Now, why are they emptying the mind? If I were to tell you, to focus on nothing by focusing and meditating on a spot of light, just a spot of light. Is that focus or detachment? You're focusing so narrowly on a spot of light that you are detaching, not allowing anything else to come into your heart, your mind. You are detaching, not focus. Okay, that's Eastern meditation. And so, in Eastern meditation, to do this now, I'm going to show you what happens to your brain and then your mind when you do that. Okay? Yoga Nidra. The scientists looked at. I'm not going through all who said what. Okay? Uh, it's all on my website. You can check out the science. Yoga Nidra. Th there is decreased blood flow in the prefrontal cortex. In other words, your frontal lobe. You do no yoga. Your blood flow to your frontal lobe goes down. Is that good? Uh -uh. You must do nothing, nothing at all, to impair your frontal lobe. In fact, you need the exercise, you need blood flow, you need oxygen, you need energy. Okay? Yoga Nidra does the opposite. Now, the most common phrase, in, if you Google Eastern meditation, is the frontal cortex tends to go offline during meditation. What does it mean? It means that you have a perfectly healthy frontal lobe. But when you begin to do meditation, you take it, a healthy frontal lobe, offline, as if it is not there. Now, how do they do it? Like I told you, they starved it. They would not let any thoughts come in. Okay? They starve the frontal lobe, and blood flow goes down. Now, what happens when that happens? Andrew Newberg, he's a top researcher in this field. He says, in meditation, there is a frontal lobe and a parietal lobe relationship. Now, what's your parietal lobe? Your parietal lobe is what tells you where you are in three-dimensional space. 
For example, Ronald, is, he knows he's about 20 feet from me, he's 20 feet from the ceiling. He has a, a general sense of his body shape. He's sitting there with his arms crossed. He knows where he is. But when the parietal goes down, he loses the sense of his body shape and where he is. So he has got no boundary. He is one with the whole universe, and the whole universe is one with him. So that happens when the blood flow goes reduced, and you're starving it for hours, the frontal lobe, your parietal goes down, and then you feel that you are one with everything. Okay, that is the deep end, the, the dangerous end of meditation. When they feel that way, they feel like they are one with the universe. They are one with everything. Now, this amazing feeling is in the brain. It's a phenomenon. Right? And you, they, it's so ecstatic, so euphoric, that you've got to give meaning to something like that. And they, if you're meditating now with Hindus, they will say, this is nirvana. If you're meditating with Buddhists, and Buddha came to this place, you are liberated, free. Now, Christians are doing it. They're using Christian mantras like Maranatha, like Jesus have mercy on my soul. And the same thing happens in the brain. And when you're meditating with Christians, they say, now you're in the presence of God. The same neural phenomena, given different names, different meaning. Right? But it's only feelings, it's only brain phenomena. Now, this is the icon of meditation. Right? One moment, as you're meditating, you're yourself, a drop of water. In the next moment, when your parietal goes down, you merge with, they say, the cosmic ocean, and you become one with the universe. <laughs> That's the icon. That's what it means. Okay, so what's happening now is this. Christians are meditating. Young kids are medit doing mindfulness. When the parietal goes down, they give... Something happens in their brain and they've got to give it meaning. They give it language to describe it. And this language is formed when that happens. So it's one feeling with many languages. Nirvana, liberation, presence of God. Oh, mindfulness calls it being in the moment. Right? Because you lose sense of, you see, when you get here, when you lose your position, three-dimensional space, three-dimensional space, three-dimensional space not only gives you your position, it gives you a sense of time. When you're in infinity, there's no sense of time. Right? So you're in the moment. Right? Because the parietal goes down. Now, Jordan Grafman, he's a cognitive neuroscientist, director of brain injury research. Now, he says this, the frontal lobes are the most evolved areas of the human brain and help control and make sense of the perceptual input we get from the world. Further investigation revealed that damage to a specific area of the brain known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was linked to markedly increased mysticism. When the frontal lobes' inhibitory functions are suppressed, a door of perception can open, increasing the chances of mystical experiences. So people without frontal lobe or damaged frontal lobe have these experiences. So what, what happens to meditators? They've got a perfectly good frontal lobe. They reduce the blood flow. They starve it until it is taken offline. And then mystical experience happens. In other words, they have a perfectly healthy frontal lobe which they treat as if it's damaged. Treat it, take it offline. And you've got problems. Mystical experiences. Now, this lady, you can look at her on YouTube, all right? Jill Bolt, she's a scientist. When she had a brain hemorrhage whilst exercising, she said her body felt with, it had no border. It, she was getting a, a massive hemorrhage, okay? A, a, going to call the ambulance, and this happened to her. Her body was merging with the wall, and she became one with everything. So it takes a damaged brain to feel that way or meditating brain that deactivates part of your brain. The scientists are actually causing this type of thing, meditation, self-hypnosis. Right? They actually say that, not just one, many, many, many. Now, what is hypnosis? 
Uh, Columbia University tells you what hypnosis is. Now, you in your frontal lobe have got two parts of your brain that are responsible. One part, the ACC, responsible for your will. Okay? And there's another part in the front called the lateral frontal cortex, LFC, responsible for reality. They are both working all the time. And Columbia University found that when they put someone successfully under hypnosis, one or the other is disconnected, switched off. One is not working. One or the other is not working. That's when you're successfully hypnotized. Now, what's hypnosis? Hypnosis is the ability to suggest something to you which is not true. All right? So, if I were to suggest to this young lady here, listen, you're a man. Her will will say, no, I'm a lady, I'm a girl. And then her reality says, yeah, I've been a, 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 a girl for 20 years. <laughs> right? So the will and reality are working. Right? She rejects that suggestion. Now, if I can shut off her frontal lobe, that suggestion will go through. Okay? That's hypnosis. Now, so Columbia University tells you that when one or the other is switched off, or when both are switched off, you hypnotize. Now, what is the suggestion that comes through when a meditator meditates, there's less blood flow, his frontal lobe is shut down, and what suggestion comes through to him? His frontal lobe, both ACC, will and reality, are switched off. What suggestion comes to him? If you were Hindu, meditating in a Hindu temple, the suggestion is when you even went and stepped in the Hindu temple, the suggestion is, that, that, that's divinity of all humanity. Everyone has the divine God within them. That's the suggestion. And when you discover it, it's called Nirvana. The suggestion comes true when you meditate. Uh, Buddha liberated. What was he liberated from? He was liberated from karma and reincarnation. Now, karma is your good-bad account. If you've got too much evil in your account, you've got to balance it off. If not, in your next life, reincarnation, you may be reincarnated into something uh, inferior, like a pig or a cow or something, right? So there's karma, there's reincarnation. So when Buddha meditated, he came to this point of his parietal going down, his frontal lobe going down, and when you are one with the universe, infinite, mentally you're infinite, there's no no, no, no end to who, who you are. Physically, you are infinite. Mentally, you're infinite. And spiritually, now this is where it's really important. Spiritually, there are no limits. In other words, there's no good, no evil. Or you're not able to discern good and evil. Alright? No heaven, no hell. No life, no death. Okay? No polar opposites. All polar opposites cease. That's when you're one with the universe. Okay, so what was liberation for a Buddhist? When he was meditating, he came to this part, point where he need not and could not discern between good and evil. Now, when you cannot discern between good and evil, is there karma? No. So he was liberated from karma. Okay, now that deals with karma. If you look at life and death, if there's no life, no death, is there reincarnation? No. No life, no death. So, he was liberated from karma and reincarnation. So, when you're, the suggestion when you're meditating with Buddhists is, you are liberated. That's the suggestion. Now, you're meditating with Christians now. Rick Warren said, tweet it out. Do a breath prayers. In fact, he tweeted out something else. He said, go and do centering prayer, which is a Catholic form of mantra-based meditation. And I'll, I'll deal with a lot of that later in the afternoon. He tweeted that out. So what they're suggesting is, oh, go, go meditate, because at that point, the suggestion that comes through is you're one with God. But it's only a neural phenomenon. It's not real. And they're all using this neural phenomena. Now, James Brake, he was a founder of hypnotism. And he 
invented it, but in his mind, you need someone to, to hypnotize another. I need to hypnotize you. That's James Bray in 1840. Now, what happened was, he wrote a book, and the book went far and wide. And his friends in the East said, hey, James, you know, the, the people in Persia and the people in India, they're hypnotizing themselves. They don't need somebody else to hypnotize them. They're meditating and hypnotizing themselves. So James had a look at this, and then he confirmed. He said, there is no need for an exoteric influence. Exoteric means external. You can hypnotize yourself. You don't need someone outside. So what's happening is Eastern meditation uses a lot of sensory phenomena, neural phenomena, to launch one into divinity, into the sense of divinity. Because their underlying belief is that God and every man, every man is one. Okay? And that meditation helps you to realize that, to feel that, to feel that union. Now, there are a lot other, and I will deal with this in the afternoon, a lot other uh, uh, signs to show you what happens. I've dealt with low blood flow, uh, frontal lobe going offline, starving the frontal and then the parietal is de deactivated. I've dealt with hypnosis. But there are more sleep waves in the brain than uh, beta waves. Your beta waves is just very active right now, I hope. Nobody's falling asleep. <laughs> okay, your, your fast wave beta. You're wondering what I, whether I'm telling you the truth. You say, I'm going to Google and find out more. That's fast wave beta. When you fall off to sleep, as you're falling off, it slows down. That's alpha. And if I'm boring, I say 10 words, you can only hear three. And then you go, if I'm boring, you go into theta, deep sleep wave. And when I speak, say 10 words, you hear nothing. All right? So that, the, the brain in meditation goes into alpha and theta. And then the amygdala, I talked about the amygdala, it's calm. Your stress is overtaken. But although it's calm, the frontal lobe doesn't come on. So there's no hope, no optimism. Okay? And then there's 70 more percent more dopamine in your brain, your own dopamine, which causes addiction. Dopamine causes you to meditate, meditate, meditate. To the point that it leads you, because you're meditating so much, it leads you to your parietal going down. So it's like a, a church usher ushering you to this point where your parietal goes down, to the dangerous point. So you get to this point. The whole idea is to get to this point. So, and then when you get to this point, they have words like Advaita, Nirvana, Satori, Oneness, Liberation, Enlightenment, Cosmic Consciousness, Universal Consciousness. Now, Christians doing it is oneness with God. That is that moment. Now, the Hindus say this word, Namasti, right? Namasti. What does Namasti mean when you're greeted? Namasti. It means I see the divine in you. There is the suggestion already that you have a divine. And you greet me back and say, I, Namasti, I also see the divine in you. So it's an assertion of divinity within humanity. And this is third International Yoga Day, just went past about two months ago. It's about Namasti. It's all-inclusive humanity, union of polarities. In other words, all these things, life and death, good and evil, you and I, are no more. It ceases to, be, to exist. It's a union of opposites in two, one. That's what it means. Now, sounds good. Was it true? Right? So it's a, 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 an all-inclusive humanity. It's on a platform of love, and it's the union of both good and evil, heaven and hell, life and death, into one. Is that true? Can that be true? At the end of time, God destroys evil, right? He destroys death, right? There's only one, the absolute good that can exist. So this is not true. But we are led to believe that this is love. Right? Now, now, I want to make this point very clear to you. Where meditation is bringing you is to bring the mind to a point where you do not need to differentiate. For example, take this church, the two sides. This side. Let's say you're all good. Okay? And this side, you're all evil. 
I'm so sorry, but I chose you. <laughs> had to choose one side. All right, all good, all evil. Now I choose to sit with them sometimes, and I choose to sit with you sometimes, and I really don't care to differentiate. Do I care about you, really? Do I love you? Yes or no? No, I don't care really. Sometimes I sit there too. Do I love you? No. So what they're saying is, when the mind comes to a point where you don't differentiate between people, you love them all. It's not just about people. It's about what is good and what is evil. Not who. Not necessarily who is good and who is evil. We are to love everybody, right? But we must differentiate between what is good and what is evil. And to make the point of what more clearly, like let's say you are country A and you're country B and you're at war, and one day I spy for you against them, and the next day I spy for them against you. Do I love you? No. Do I love you? I can only love when I differentiate. That's Christianity. That's biblical. King David came to that point, right? He wanted to know about himself, my secret faults, my presumptuous sins. That's true biblical meditation. That's the outcome. So, this is this non-differentiation and saying that is love is spiritualism. So, when this happened a long time ago, all right. Let, let, me, let me just talk about pantheism first, okay? Pantheism. What does pantheism mean? Pan means all. Theism means God. Pantheism means all is God. Non-differentiation. Now, you know, some time ago, there was the heresy, the alpha heresy, John Harvey Kellogg, which we defeated in 1903. That was pantheism. The suggestion by Kellogg was, Oh, God is in the flowers and the trees and the air and therefore in everyone. That's heresy. And we chucked it up. Alan White chucked it up in 1903, successfully. So the question I have is, if that was pantheism and that was the alpha heresy, what is the next stage of its development? Because Alan White said, be careful. Right? The alpha will become the omega. The last heresy. Right? And it happens outside. And it tries to come in. So what is the omega? What's this? Where will it go? Now, panentheism. This one, panentheism. The new word in there is N. Pan is still all. Theism is God. N is within, inborn. Panentheism means God is in everyone, inborn. God the person. You see, pantheism was God as energy. All right? Like Kellogg said, the flowers and the trees in the air, and therefore in everyone. God is an essence, a spirit. It's gravity and so forth. But here in panentheism, it's God the person, His Holy Spirit in everyone, irrespective. That's how it's developing. Now, where did it all start? Pantheism, panentheism, where did it all start? It started in Eden. And, and this is Alan White speaking. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. The foundation, now foundation is strength, right? The foundation of his work was laid by the assurance given to Eve in Eden. Ye shall not surely die. In the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan said to Eve, Oh yeah, God is good, absolutely good, but come, come, come on over. He told you not to, not to eat of this tree, but you can eat of any tree. You don't have to differentiate. You don't have to make that difference. Come on over. Come on to my side, right? And on my side, your eyes will be open. Now in meditation, your consciousness is raised. That's when the eyes are open. You'll be as gods, right? Meditation say you're 
inborn with the spirit, or not spirit of God, but you're inborn with divinity and you're one with God. So when you meditate, you to feel that and to realize that. So in meditation, you are to have your eyes open that you'll be as gods. Now, what about this phrase, knowing good and evil? Did Satan say to Eve, come on over and know the difference between good and evil? No, because if he had said that, Eve, come over and know the difference between good and evil, and Eve, knowing the difference between good and evil, would have gone back to that side. Right? So what he said was, come on over. Don't have to differentiate between the trees. Come on to my side. You don't have to differentiate between good and evil. On my side, you go beyond good and evil. There are no limits, no differentiation. That's what was suggested. So, it all started there. Ellen White said, said so. And she added, little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. In other words, Satan laid that foundation, the immortality of the soul, that inborn divinity. He laid it in Eden, and then over 6,000 years, he develops it, until at the end, it's his masterpiece of deception. Now, I'm going to show you in the afternoon, in the 6,000 years, what it has become. What, how did he develop it? In Om, in Hinduism. How he developed it in Greek philosophy. How it is even in the Korean flag. How it is in Yin Yang and Tai Chi. How it is now in meditation. Oh, meditation was in Om, Hinduism. 300, 200 years after Tower of Babel. How it's been developed over time. And now it is in psychotherapy. It is in mindfulness for children. And it is with kings of the earth because they are doing meditation. In G20, when G20, the 20 top nations met, the meditators were there teaching our leaders how to meditate. Oh, by the way, my late Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was meditating. Christian meditation, Catholic meditation with a Benedictine monk. I'll show you uh, what they say and how they're saying it and what the inference is this afternoon. And my current Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong, is also doing it. Okay? So it is very, very strong and very popular. It is with the kings of the earth. Now, Ellen White said this, The wine of Babylon is the exalting of the false and spurious Sabbath above the Sabbath which the Lord Jehovah hath blessed and sanctified for the use of man and the pagan teaching of the immortality of the soul. These and kindred heresies. Now, these meaning spurious Sabbath and the pagan teaching of the immortality of the soul. These and kindred heresies. In other words, Heresy is true. The, the wine of Babylon is heresies. But two active ones, active ingredient. Immortality of the soul and spirit Sabbath. So, it's our message. This is the second angel's message. So, we are called to make that distinction. To differentiate and not to get involved with these things. And to give the warning. Right? Now, this is going back to 1903, Kellogg. Kellogg came to see one of our leaders and our leaders, A.G. Daniels, then wrote to W.C. White. Now, Kellogg at first was talking about the alpha heresy, God and the flowers and the trees, the essence, gravity, essence, spiritual, spirit, not God the person. Okay? Then he began to change his mind. He began to say, he told me, now this is Daniel saying, Kellogg told me that he now believed in God the Father and God the Son. So uh, uh, Kellogg is beginning to believe in, in the Father, okay, the person of God, and God the Holy Ghost. And his view was that it was God the Holy Ghost and not God the Father that filled all space and everything in it. In other words, Kellogg began to shift from pantheism, essence, into panentheism, God the person in everyone. So in 1903, he began to shift, okay? and he was defeated. 
Now, our message, the three angels' message. First angel's message is fear God. Second angel's message is the wine of Babylon. And the third angel's message is the spirit of Sabbath. Now, what did Ellen White say? Is the foundation, the strength of the wine of Babylon, the immortal soul, right? So the second angel's message identifies the strength of evil, right? And this is the spirit of Sabbath. If you drink that wine, you will accept the spirit of Sabbath. Now, the first message is the power of truth. The second and third message talks about the evil of deception. The first message is righteousness by faith. It is the power of truth. So what does the first message say? The first message says, fear God. Give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made the heavens and the earth. Now what it means is this. When we fear God, we will hate evil. The Bible says that, you know. Proverbs 8.13, when we fear God, is to hate evil. The more we love God, the more we hate sin. And when we hate sin, we want to know our faults and our presumptuous sins. We want to be purged. And when we want to purge, we cling on to Christ. And as He draws us, He cuts self from the soul. He cuts selfishness from the soul. And when He does that, He gives us His righteousness and His righteous acts. And He even gives us a day, a sign, the Sabbath, a sign of His sanctification. That is in the first message. So the first message is about righteousness by faith. And that is the power of truth. And here, when you put the three messages together, the power of truth is head to head in a collision with the power of evil. And we are called to bring this out to the world, not just in our own lives. Of course, it has to happen first in our own lives. Because if we had no righteousness, we won't hate evil. And I said to you, oh, meditation is evil. That, that's how they do it. This is evil and that's evil. If you had no righteousness, you couldn't care less. It's just another evil. Now, Ellen White said this, spiritualism. She said there are many forms of spiritualism. It appeals to everyone. He said there are gross forms of spiritualism. And the gross forms of spiritualism is when you don't care about what you hear, what you see, what you eat, when you sleep, what you do. That is gross forms of spiritualism. But the kind of spiritualism we are, I'm talking about here is the spiritualism at the high level. The things that unite the world. And I'll show you who is using it, what they're saying, and they're forming this platform of false love that will unite the world. That's the kind of spiritualism I am dealing with. But spiritualism is the same. That, that, that feature of spiritualism, of non-differentiation, is at the gross form as at the high level form. So, without righteousness by faith, without something that we desire to differentiate in our own lives, it is just another evil. I'm not doing it, I'm okay. That's not the message. The message is this form of evil at the top is spreading like wildfire. I don't know if I told you this, my friend Australia, his granddaughter came back from school and she was in her room and he opened the door and found her sitting there cross-legged meditating. I said, where do you learn this? You see, in school. Right? A doctor in Alice Springs, in the middle of the desert in Australia, calls me up and says, may I have your PowerPoints? I say, why? He said, the school, my children's school, are bringing it in, mindfulness. Oh, I said, and I thought to myself, in the middle of Australia, in the desert? It's become systemic. The moment mindfulness gets into the education system in Sydney, it gets into Alice Springs. So it's systemic already. Now, it is about the divinity of man inborn. How evil is that? We, the Bible tells us when we look into ourselves, we see evil. And that's good because that drives us to Christ. Right? But 
the immortality of the soul suggests that you are born with divinity. And all you need to do is to discover it in meditation. How evil is that? I want to ask you to come to the afternoon session, okay? Uh, I will deal with a lot more uh, things and um, you will learn a whole lot. Uh, I've been speaking on this subject for uh, about one and a half years now. Twice in the US, twice in Canada, three times in Australia, and three ABN Australia also got me on. Not because my material is good, but because it is relevant to today, what's happening out there. Okay, so please, I hope to see you all. all right, and God bless you.